this Sabbath, the topic of uh, the sermon, the title is Conspiracy Behind Conspiracy. There is conspiracy and there is conspiracy behind conspiracy. Let me explain that. I grew up in a communist country and uh, since I became seven, that country is a former communist country, meaning the regime fell. In those days, during the communist regime, it was uh, very customary for innocent people to be dragged before the authorities and uh, interrogated, humiliated, even uh, punished for some imaginary wrongdoings. Some would be punished by just cutting back on some privileges. Some would be punished by prison. Some would be beaten up. Some would be even killed. It was fact. Now, the, the weird thing about it was that many of these incidents started out as some very common, petty little dissensions or dispute among regular people. Two people that had different ideas on some aspects of life, maybe on a weekend, because yes, this happened often on a weekend, they just have a casual conversation in which they disagree, and then uh, the conversation is over, but uh, Monday morning, a gentleman from uh, the security, state security department shows up at the door of one of them, or in some cases at the door of both of them, because you never knew who was who and who was behind whom. Somebody would just show up there, knock on the door, and tell the person, please follow me. And the person would follow to the police station or whatever other office. And then, again, interrogation and a whole ordeal could develop. Interestingly, from something very petty, very little, very insignificant, at one point you could end up seeing yourself fighting a whole ideological system and it was like the whole world was now conspiring against you, out of the blue. There was a difference between those that uh, walked into these kind of crossfires without God and those that walked into these kind of situations with God. Those that did not necessarily have God in the picture, they knew there was conspiracy. You couldn't trust people. You had a hard time finding somebody reliable because you could think somebody is reliable, somebody is your friend, but then, a few days later, it turns out you were turned into and uh, turned over to the security department. But those who had God in this picture, they knew something. They knew there was conspiracy, and there was conspiracy behind conspiracy. Conspiracy was people of all kind plotting or conspiring against you and against others. But there was also a level of conspiracy behind conspiracy, a battle, a war you could not necessarily see, but that did not make it less real. I'm asking you, what do you think on the first Sabbath of 2023? Is there a conspiracy out there? 
Yes or no? Is there also conspiracy behind conspiracy? Let's go to the Bible. It's interesting how God arranges things. Little did I know when I started to preach from the book of Ephesians that God will line those topics up, line them out in a way that this topic will be a segue into the 10 days of prayer. And then next Sabbath's topic, which will be the final presentation from the book of Ephesians, will be also focusing on prayer. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to start reading with uh, verse 10. Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Let us pray. Lord, may your spirit strengthen us in Jesus' name, and may you enlighten our hearts and mind. Amen. Finally, says the apostle, finally, that's uh, sort of a conclusion. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Finally. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Be strong? Yes. We've seen this before. We've seen before that there is a way of becoming strong in the Lord. And we would like to know that indeed in the Lord, there is a certain way of being strong, which we've seen already in chapter 1, verse 19. In chapter 1, verse 19, Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened so that you will know what is the exceeding greatness of His power. The word is dunamis. Toward us who believe according to the working, the word is energeia of the power of His might. Going back to the verse uh, that was on the screen before, verse 10, Paul says, be strong, and the word is dunamo, and dunamo, empowered. In the Lord and in the power, that is kratos, of His might, ischios. Same words that appear in chapter 1, I told you at that time when I preached from that chapter, uh, this sounds something, somewhat like this. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your hearts will be enlightened so that you will be able to know what the power of the power of the power of His power is. And you would ask, what kind of power is that? Well, the text continues there in chapter 1 with verse 20, and Paul explains which is the power that worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead. This is the power of resurrection. That's the power that is available to you. But that power of resurrection is also used for Christ to be seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. So it has two functions. One is resurrection. The other one is seating Christ at the right hand of God in heavenly places. For what reason? Verse 21. For far above, far above principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in which is in the age that is to come, and He put all, you have things in brackets there, but that means all, meaning things and people, and other forces. God put all under His feet. 
When is the point in history when God puts all under Christ's feet? Please? When is that point in history when God put all under Christ's feet? That's the cross. Because after the cross, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me where? Where? On earth and in heaven. He's got it all. And now the Apostle Paul says, I want you to be strengthened. I want you to have this power. I want you to have this might. Yes, because you and I, we can be empowered by God with the same kind of power, the power of resurrection and exaltation that placed Jesus Christ above everything and above everybody. When you think about such power, you may think, okay, but why is this even necessary? Well, Paul is going to give you the answer. He goes on and he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able or that you may have the power, the dynamis to stand against the wiles. And I'm translating in brackets there what it means, the wiles, the methods, methodos, that's the Greek, the schemes, the plotting, if you want so, or you can even say the conspiracies of the devil. That's why you need that power, so that you can stand against the wiles, the methods, the schemes, the, the plottings, the conspiracies of the devil. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle, we do not fight, we do not combat, we do not battle against flesh and blood. Who is flesh and blood? You and I, we are flesh and blood. That's not what we or whom we combat, but against principalities or chiefs, against powers or authorities, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, cosmocratoras, cosmic powers of darkness. That's what Paul says. Cosmic powers of darkness against spiritual hosts or forces of wickedness or evil in the heavenly places, in the heavenly realms. There is conspiracy, and then there is conspiracy behind conspiracy. And what Paul says, yes, you may be concerned what will happen in 2023 with people, because there is war, there is all kind of struggles, there's all kind of dangers out there, everybody's conspiring about everything against everybody, but that's not the point, he says. The point is we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against these, these forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What forces are those? In the book of Daniel chapter 10, we get a glimpse of what happens in the parallel reality of earthly realities. In uh, chapter 10, Daniel is praying. He's praying actually and fasting. And uh, he's doing that for quite some time. And after three weeks, angel Gabriel shows up. He comes to him and he says something very interesting to him. Listen, Daniel. From the first day you prayed, I was already deployed. I was already sent to go to you. But something happened. What happened, Gabriel? The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 24, 21 days, that is three weeks. And behold, Michael, one of the chief priests, princes, Michael being one of the trios, of one of the trio of heaven, God, the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit, Michael himself stepped in. He came to help me for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. How do I know there is the kings of Persia and then there is somebody behind the kings of Persia? In this passage, it's very simple. Because you have the kings of Persia, but at the beginning of the verse it says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Oh, and that prince is somewhat similar to the chief prince, Michael. So this is not a human uh, flesh and blood kind of leader. This is somebody behind the flesh and blood leaders of the kingdom of Persia. Is that real? Of course it is real. And this is what the picture of the Bible is. Whenever people pray for God's intervention, God deploys angels, messengers, to help them out, to protect them, to save them from different situations, to guide them. But that kind of deployment quite often is being resisted by some potent heavenly beings. Beings that conspire against the one who asks for divine intervention. Let me give you just quickly some Bible verses. Psalm 91, verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Is that an angelic deployment? Of course it is. Psalm 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord, that is Yahweh, the angel of Yahweh in campus, encamps all around those who fear him. And what does he do? Delivers them. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. I'm, I'm sure you know this verse. Are they not, says the apostle, ministering spirits? Are they who? Not. Angels. Are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Are they not ministering spirits? Of course they are. But as I said, when God wants to deploy ministering spirits, there are some other spirits that withstand. Why do they have a problem with God deploying some of His ministering spirits? Well, the Bible says that the earth is somehow mapped out among the forces of evil. I don't know if you're aware of this. I, I would like to show you a very interesting Bible passage, but that's not the only one. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, I'm reading from the NRSV. This is what it says. When the Most High apportioned the nations, when He divided humankind, He fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the, of the gods. Well, some translations will have sons of Israel according to numbers of the number of the sons of Israel or according to the number of the sons of God. Interestingly, the Septuagint, which is the first Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, says according to the number of the angels of God. Those different translations happen because of uh, some differences in the manuscripts. But this is the point. If you read on, the text gives you a clue that it seems that the number of the gods or the sons of God or the angels of God as the rabbis understood it is the correct translation. Why? Go, and at verse, uh, go to verse, verse 9. For the Lord's, that is Yahweh's portion, is His people. That is Israel, whose portion is Israel? Israel is Yahweh's portion. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. But then whose portion are the other nations? Jump to verse 17 and look what it says. They sacrifice, that is the nations, they sacrifice to whom? Oh, to demons, not to God. To gods 
they did not know. So putting all things together, it seems that what is called in the Old Testament, the gods of the nations, you, you, you heard about that, the gods of the nations, they seem to be demons, evil spirits that somehow masquerade as gods. And the nations serve those gods. And uh, painfully, God sometimes says that Israel plays the harlot with the gods of the nations. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? But you may think, okay, that was Ben. Is that still now? Well, at the cross, something happened. You may remember Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like a lightning. Do you remember that verse? And then after the cross, he says, all authority was given to me. Obviously, he got the power back. But did these gods of the nation back down? Or are they still claiming authority over the nations? It seems to me that we are still dealing with a situation where although by his victory at the cross, Jesus Christ got all the authority, there is still claims out there of the gods of the nations to rule over the nations. And uh, you can see that in the Bible. Let me give you some elements of history that could possibly illustrate this kind of reality. You probably remember that in the history of uh, the United States, there's a time where there was a civil war. A civil war, you know the, the, the years approximately? It was 1861 to 65. Have you ever asked yourself, why did that civil law, uh, civil war, last so long? Because the driving force, in theory, of that war was what? It was the abolition of slavery. Correct? Okay, so then why did it last so long? Almost five years, that's a long time of civil war. We only had a, a year, roughly, in Ukraine, and, and we are desperate. Then think about five years. In the, the immediate reality, or at the surface, you may think, yeah, because those generals, those army officers didn't organize things well, maybe there was some betrayal, maybe there were some interests, and there, yes, there were interests. Because many in the north did not fully fight against slavery, because they knew slavery was wrong, they had some other interests in the background. But there is conspiracy behind conspiracy. And in those days, Ellen White writes Testimony, Volume 1. Before that, in 1858, she had a vision called the Great Controversy Vision. You probably heard about that. He also wrote a book that uh, saw its first edition in 1858. Well, you usually know that book by the great controversy. That's it. But that's not the full title of the book. You know what the full title of the book is? The great controversy between Christ and his angels and Satan and his... Now, that's the perspective. That's, the pers that's a totally different kind of story than just saying great controversy. Between who and who? Between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels. And look what she says about what was happening between the Union and the Confederate States in those days. It's uh, Testimony Volume 1, 364. Very many men in authority, she says, generals and officers, act in conformity with instructions communicated by, by whom? Not humans? 
No, no, by spirits. The spirits of devils professing to be dead warriors and skillful generals communicate with men in authority and control men of their movements. Many of their movements. Wow, isn't that interesting? Now, you may believe or not, that's your decision. But I'm just trying to suggest to you that there is a way of looking at reality that is way beyond just scrutinizing this little conspiracy kind of thing going on. No, no, there's conspiracy behind conspiracy. And last time, when I preached from Ephesians, I mentioned to you that um, today we don't have slavery as in those days, but we have, among other types of slavery, what I called ideological slavery. What does it mean? When some ideologist subjugate your understanding of reality and make you believe whatever they want you to believe and act accordingly. Watch what Ellen White says about those kind of things. It is no part of Christ's mission to compel men to receive him. It is Satan and men actuated by his spirit that seek to compel the conscience. And she goes on saying, under a pretense of zeal for righteousness, men who are confederate, that word is very strong there, it's like men who are in conspiracy with evil angels, bring suffering upon their fellow men in order to convert them to their ideas of religion. She goes on, there can be no conclusive, more conclusive evidence, watch this, no more conclusive evidence that we possess the spirit of Satan than the disposition to hurt and destroy those who do not appreciate our work or who act contrary to our ideas. Conspiracy and conspiracy above conspiracy. And the Bible uses the expression spirit of. Spirit of. I have a list of, of spirits. Well, some of them. Spirit of bondage, of fear, of error, of deception, of jealousy, of haughtiness, of infirmity, and so on and so forth. Ellen White does not use the word spirit. She goes to the word demons. And she says demon of strife, of intemperance, of selfishness, of greed, of ambition, of jealousy, passion, unkindness, darkness, heresy, hysterics, and satanic imaginings, or of appetite in the intoxicating cup. And you may think, well, with all kinds of spirits or demons out there, I should be always on the lookout because behind every bush, there's a spirit. And Ellen White says, warning, warning. She says in the same book, Desire of Ages, there are Christians who think and speak altogether too much about the power of Satan. Too much. They think of their adversary. They pray about him. They talk about him. And he looms up greater and greater in their imagina imagination. And she goes on. It is true that Satan is a powerful being. No discussion. No doubt about it. But thank God we have a mighty Savior who cast out the evil one from heaven. Satan is pleased when we magnify his power. Why not talk of Jesus? Why not magnifying his power and his love? With this in mind, go back to verse 11. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able, you may have the power to stand. Against what? Against the wiles, the methods, the schemes, the plottings, the conspiracies of the devil. Put on the whole armor. Verse 12. 
for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Why not waste your time wrestling against flesh and blood? I would like you to consider at least three arguments. One of them is because if you wrestle against flesh and blood, you will find yourself overgeneralizing, overgeneralization. Yes, you will have the impression everybody out there is conspiring against you. Everybody out there is going to get you somehow. No, no. God says, don't waste your time. Don't waste your, your time overgeneralizing. Then there is another reason why. If you think there's always somebody plotting against you, you are right, because there's human plotting. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, you will find that in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but that is about men or deceitful conspiracy. That's about men there. But if you start focusing on every person that can possibly conspire against you, you can easily also find yourself in a partisanship kind of reality. Let me explain that. Partisanship kind of reality. The devil <coughs> often uses the impression you have a group of good people here conspiring against or, or, or fighting against a group of bad people here. And these bad people here are constantly conspiring against these good people here. Problem is, the devil has the ability to create diversions. And you can find yourself in a situation when you have the impression, now you have to join either this group or this group. When in fact, both groups are his groups. It's just to fool you. And that's how you can end up in a bi-party political system to have the impression everything, everybody on this side of the spectrum is from the devil and everybody on the other side of the spectrum is from the good Lord and the other way around. See what, what the point is? You have the impression you always have to take party. One side or the other side. And when you do that, you can find yourself fighting a cause that is nothing but the cause of the devil. And a third possible reason is what I call conspiranoia. When you are doing conspiracy hunting, and there are people even people of very strong religious, let alone Seventh-day Adventist background, that know everything that is happening out there. All the conspiracy that is done by the Pope. All the conspiracy that is done by the group of Davis. All the conspiracy that is done by the government. All the conspiracy of the CDC. They know every secret of every secret society. Isn't that weird? You know, there was years ago, there was a TV show in which somebody asked one of the former presidents, you are on that secret society. And he smilingly responded, it's so secret we can't speak about it. <laughs> Weirdly enough, there are people that can speak about everything. They know everything, all the secrets. But Paul says, no, no, no. Don't waste your time with that. That is not whom you are fighting against. It's not flesh and blood, no. Because 
from among those that are flesh and blood, I want to rescue my people. Among those are, that are flesh and blood, I have my own people as well. Don't overgeneralize. Don't take parts or sides. And don't go for the conspiracy hunting. That's not your business. Because your fight is with the other conspiracy, the conspiracy above conspiracy. Verse 13, chapter 6, verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done or accomplished all, to stand. You want to withstand the devil and his forces, and you want to be able to stand. Verse 14, stand, he says, therefore, having girded your waist with the truth. I would like to ask um, a boy or a girl up to 10 years old, okay, to please come and help me a little bit, okay? A boy and a, or a girl, okay, come and help me, please. Quickly, come on, okay? Okay, a little boy or a little girl, okay? I'm going to give you something interesting, okay? Come on, come on. Come, let, let, let's do something together. I need you to help me. Come on. No? Okay, go, come on, come on, come on. Okay. All right. Oh, I thought it was okay. Put on the belt of truth. Do you know? Okay. Too much cloth. All right. You got it. Okay. Do you know why this is important? The belt of truth? <coughs> Those that go to gym. You know there is belts there. Why? The belt holds you together. Okay? Let me give you something. And then put on what? Verse 14. Put on, verse 14, the breastplate of righteousness. Okay? Let me... Solve the problem quickly. Okay. I need some more helpers. Okay. Who else can help me? Then put on what? I, I, maybe, maybe this should have gone to you because you don't have shoes. <laughs> All right. Who can help me? All right. Come on, come on. Quickly, quickly. Put on verse 15. Verse 15. Having shod your feet with the preparation or the readiness, firm footing or shin guards, some say this is the shin guard, okay, of the gospel of peace, okay, this comes here. And I think there's a reason why some say it should be shin guards, because indeed in combat, they aim quite often to hit your shin. I think I put them the other way around, but that's beyond point. <laughs> okay? So, <laughs> you need here the shins of the gospel of peace. Now, let's see what. Okay? Put on the shield of faithfulness. You put on the shield of faithfulness. Okay. All right. And then you put on what? The helmet. Who's going to put on the helmet? I need somebody. No, somebody else. Come on, come on, quickly. Okay. Oh? Okay. Judah? <laughs> come on, come on, come on. All right. All right. Okay. 
Let me, let me, let me do something else. I'm going to give the, the uh, helmet to this little girl here. Come on, come on here. Okay. All right. Excellent. And I'm going to give Judah the sword. Now, please line up, line up, line up beautif beautifully like an army, okay? Line up like an army. You, you come here, okay? Next to me. Next to me here. You come here. Okay? Come here, Emma. Come here. Okay? Here is the point. Something is wrong with what I did. You tell me what. Sorry? I gave one piece of the armor to different individuals, but that's not what the text says. What does the text say? Each of them should put on all the armor. But why? Because an army, because this is all plural. When Paul says take up or put on, everything is plural. This is an imagery of the church of Christ. And when he says put on, he refers to plural, to the church. An army in which each soldier only has one piece of armor. That looks ridiculous. Right? Now, you look beautiful. But imagine how beautiful it would be if each one of them had the full armor. And that's the picture that the Apostle Paul gives. And please notice something. That of all these pieces of armor, the majority of those pieces of armor are for defense. What is the belt for? Defense. What is those shins for? Defense. What is this for? The breastplate. Defense. Defense. What is this for? The shield. Defense. What is this for? Protection. Protection. Defense. There's only one piece to engage the adversary. What is it? Yeah! <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> because the Word of God, that is the sword, is the gospel of, of shalom. Shalom. Of peace, the gospel of peace. You know, the other day I took my kids uh, to the park, to, to a park in the area there, and there were two guys there and uh, somebody that looked like a coach doing uh, fencing. Do you know what fencing is? That's a sport. Fencing? It's uh, a sword fighting kind of, I don't know, sport, I guess. And I watched them for more than an hour. I was sitting on my bench there and watching like, them like this, preparing a sermon. <laughs> and I noticed something. The only way for them to engage the adversary, not to kill the adversary, to engage the adversary, was what? It was not the belt, although they had a belt. The truth, the belt of truth is important, right? It was not the shoes or the chains, although those are important, aren't they? It was not the breastplate of righteousness. Is that important? Of course, it protects the heart and all the viscera. It wasn't the shield. Is the shield important? Of course, you can move it around and withstand those arrows, the darts of the enemy, the f shield of faith, I say the shield of faithfulness, because that's the biblical concept. The helmet of salvation, is it important? Absolutely. But, okay. but the, only, the only piece of armor, it's the sword, the only piece to engage 
your adversary. And I would submit to you not to kill your adversary, but to bring that adversary to peace with God Almighty. Now, how are you going to do that? Verse 18. Oh, that was it. Praying always. Can't you pray if you don't have a belt of truth? You can. Even people that have no idea of truth or biblical truth, they can pray. Can't you pray if you don't have uh, those uh, uh, shoe wear or uh, fo footwear? You can pray. Can't you pray if you don't have a breastplate or a uh, shield or what is this? A helmet? You can pray. But here's the point. What makes prayer effective? Does it matter if somebody has the full armor on? Or you just can have a piece and it doesn't matter? And the army, the church, like an army, can look like some soldiers that left half of their armor home. That's how you wrestle, says the Apostle Paul. You put on the full armor. And I'm sorry, guys, but I have to collect your armors, your pieces, and I only want to have one of you and I will, I will stay with uh, this, what's your name? Aria. Aria, beautiful little girl. And uh, we'll see. Okay, that's it. Thank you. The rest of you, you can go to your places. Give them a round of applause, please. Thank you. <laughs> and now, okay, just a moment. You will be done in a moment. Okay, let me put this on to. Okay. And this one. Good. And this one. Okay. Okay, and this one, you put your hand in there, actually this way, this way, okay, like this, all right, and now, yay, <laughs> and this is all yours, okay, excellent, you can go back, well, <laughs> praying Always. <laughs> Let me help you, okay? Doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh. Okay.